very is a pleasure to be here again this year. So let me check if I have a, here is to go on. Yes. Okay. So um, as Emil said, uh, um, I've been in the vaccine field for 15 years in infection disease. Actually started in medtech, then I went into infection disease. Then after in therapeutics and now I am venture capitalist. So I did a little bit of everything. But uh, a lot of time for 12 years, uh, I was uh, at Limatech, that is a company before Glycovaccine that developed vaccine. And I was for seven years the CEO. And uh, what uh, actually struck me and what I would like to talk with you today is about uh, really the what are at the beginning the step that you need to think about and you need to take in order to increase the probability of success to bring a vaccine at the end to the people that really need it. And because if you look at it, these are the only data that I was able to find. They say that only 10% of the vaccine that already are in phase two, and these are viral vaccine, get in 10 years to licensing. I try to look at about, okay, how much is the percentage if we look at the starting from the research I couldn't find real data, but you can imagine that the, it decreased. And probably the data are not available because in research is not so publicly available what really people uh, does, what big company are working on it and so on. But, but still, it's a very, very low number. So at the end, I think really that then you really need to think about at the beginning uh, what do you want to achieve in order to, as I said, increase this uh, uh, success? So I have your journey in mind and really try to identify what are the key points uh, that you have to think to in order to go to the next step. And we are going to discuss a little bit about, I will try to give some example, but I will tell you, you will not know everything at upfront. Actually, a lot you don't know. And that's that this is the, the key points that you will have to know. At the end, you will discover that it's something else. So his experience is looking around. We will talk. But still, it, uh, we, I believe it's important that at the beginning, you try to define on a paper really these uh, gates and go-no-go -no -go decision. Third point that I hope that at the end of this talk, you will have as well in mind that you will not make it alone. And you really need to identify all these key, key stakeholders around you that can support you through this journey. You will see the journey is long. It's going to be very frustrating. So more people are, are with you and helping you with the same vision, better you, you increase your chance of success. So that is the classical uh, development plan, actually for any type of product. So you start with an idea, then you have the discovery phase, normally it's done in academics, in pharma, in biotechs, but this is the research. Then you try to go to the preclinical proof of concept. At each step, there is some gates that you need to pass, then to enter into human, uh, then manufacturing efficacy. And I know along these two weeks, you are going very deep in each of them. So I will just give more an overview of what um, the points that you have to think about. So let's start with the idea. So when you have an idea in the project, there are different factors that you really have to start to, to look at. First of all, the, for sure, if you have a product, it's because there is a medical need. And it's important, the medical need and the how much is big, because you need to have resources to bring something to the market. So bigger is the medical need, I tell you, easier it is. Look, with the COVID, uh, huge medical need, uh, then everybody works together. When it becomes uh, a rare disease, I tell you, it's much difficult because there is less people that work on it. There is uh, less people wanted to give money because the return of investment is less. So at the beginning, really think about how big is this burden of the disease? Who is going to affect? Who needs to use it? Because it helps you to identify the key stakeholder that can really support you in your journey. 
when this is uh, uh, done, then you go to the validate to the target. Okay, what? How does it look? The components. And again, this morning you heard a little bit about you heard about adjuvant. Which one do you want to use? You need to identify the antigen actually of your vaccine. Which one? And here again, you saw that there is different technology and even even more that helps you to define to which atypo, a, a, uh, epitope you want to address, uh, which mode of action, and so. So that as well, you should try to, as far as you know, to identify it at the beginning. Look at the competition and opportunity. And this is again linked to the uh, burden of the disease. Why this is important is because, again, competition on one end is good. Because if you are the only one, it will be very difficult to make it happen. So competition helps you, helps you with other people that create data. And there as well, then you can learn from them or as well it helps you with a regulatory agency because maybe they go ready to talk to regulatory agencies so they are aware of what you are doing. So competition actually is good and please be aware of what the others does because they can be synergy, they can be help and, and so on. On the other end, if the competition is too high and you cannot differentiate yourself, that as well could be a problem. I will have a slide on that because then maybe you don't find the resources anymore because to, to bring it forward. And then the IP. Again, IP, I think it is important because there is two parts. Once you want to have the freedom to operate, you choose some antigens, make sure that these antigens are not protected because otherwise then after you will clash and you cannot use it into your vaccine. But as well, then you need to cover you when you start to continue, then you need to cover and protect your one. So that is as well an important factor that you have to think about. Then you start to put down your development plan with all, all this in mind and you have to, okay, do we have the appropriate essay? Do we have the preclinical model, the clinical plan established and as well the regulatory? Uh, we, we come back to that. And is a uh, I have the right people, do I have the money to do that? And if I don't, where do I go to ask the money? Is more uh, uh, grants uh, or NGO or venture capitalist uh, or other pharma to collaborate? So you can see it's a, it's a lot to think. And I tell you at the beginning, you will not know everything, but at least uh, you know, okay, this I don't know. When do I need to know in order to go to the next step? And it's fine. Then you say, okay, at this stage, I need at least to have the answer on this topic. I would like to go through then to this path uh, through with an example that it's very close to my heart because actually Shigel uh, uh, vaccine is uh, one of the first vaccine that uh, I started to work on it um, in 2008. So long time ago. And uh, Shigella is a, is, a, is a pathogen that belongs to the enterobacterial, is a gram-negative uh, uh, bacterial that is uh, specific to the human host. So just to give you a little bit uh, no, an overview of this pathogen for who doesn't know, is uh, transmitted by fecal oral route and is highly infectious. Normally, it's presenting to the stools of the infected people, and this is how then can get transmitted. And then you start to have the symptoms that normally come out after a few weeks. So when you, you know, when, so at the beginning, when you know what is the pathogen and disease that you want to address, so you start then to think, okay, how can I address it? So you need to understand the, the pathogenicity. You have to understand the disease. In this case, is diarrhea. Then it has as well to have a dysentery, so bloody diarrhea, and all related clinical symptoms. And so you think, okay, then what are the antigens that I want to use in order to try to address this, uh, this pathogen? In this case, sometimes you don't know. In this case, we were lucky because there were other people already working on it. And there have been data out there that's showing that the O antigen, that is this uh, glycan that they cover the bacteria, are immunogenic. And actually in convalescent people, you can find antibodies against this uh, O antigen. 
And they have been seen as well that people that are convalescent and then they, they recover from the disease, they have a, a high level of this antibody. So that was a little bit uh, um, um, already a proof uh, of a concept that this type of antigen can work. And so then you, you say, okay, then we have now tried to make it. it. And uh, this were what we, we will come, the, we are going, so we will uh, use the, this O antigen. But so what is important is really to try at the beginning to think what has been known about the disease, uh, which type of antigen somebody else use it. In this case, yes, what are the data? And uh, it's, there is a reason to believe that this it could work. But then you have to think about, they call it target product profile. So what do we need to make in you know, all these uh, uh, vaccine to make it work? And this, in addition to the disease, uh, you need to think at the, uh, at the epidemiology because you have to think about to which population affect. So are we talking to children? Are we talking to adults uh, or elderly? Because then it helps you as well to define your formulation. We talk about the adjuvant where it's needed. Which one do we want to pick? Then we have to think about where it's prevalent. It's, it's uh, everywhere, worldwide, or in specific region, and why it is in this specific region. In this case, it's really mainly in uh, developing countries. Even though now it's uh, actually coming as well more in, uh, in, uh, in our, uh, due to antibiotic resistance. And this is where this epidemiology allowed you to, uh, to identify the components uh, then that you need into your vaccine. So if you have, for example, a protein that is highly conserved in all type of strain of the disease that you want to address, in this case, a Shigella, then if it works perfect, you can use this type of protein. In this case that we use this uh, uh, glycan that covers these uh, or antigen are different. So we need, this like a streptococcus pneumonia, so with the capsule. So we had to identify, okay, in which region, which serotype are prevalent? What is the coverage that our vaccine wants to achieve? And if it's 80%, then how many components do I need to put into the vaccine in order to reach this percentage of coverage? And that maybe is already a no-go because maybe you identified that depending on the region, the strain are completely different, and then you need to have a 20 valent, and for a company, a biotech company, maybe 20 valent is something that cannot be achieved. And so you say, okay, better to look at something else. Or uh, maybe the, the, the protein that you have chosen, you will see that uh, when you look at the epidemiology, that it's not uh, conserved or it's not exposed in all, and then it's not working. So th these are all considerations that uh, has to be done. And the, again, epidemiology is something very difficult. Maybe at the beginning, you don't have data. So you need to start to get the epidemiology. And that's why knowing which group and who is working on it, it's key. Because maybe they have done it, or maybe they, you can put together a consortium to support to make this type of data. So again, uh, um, looking around at what the address does, it's, it's, it's always key in, uh, in the vaccine development. So in this case, for the Shigella, we, um, we were lucky because, yes, there were a lot of people working on it. Some of them is here in here. Uh, like Mike, and they have done immensely work, and there was as well as a lot of uh, epidemiology done. And so we knew that with four valent uh, vaccine, and namely Ceflexanai 2A, 3A6, and so on, we could have already a very good coverage of the vaccine. So that's, for example, component. Then we look at the adjuvant we discuss about, the population we discuss about, uh, and then uh, there is all now the point of the safety and effectiveness. So at the beginning as well, you should put, okay, what is the safety that you want to achieve and what is the, or the effectiveness that you want to have? Safety for sure. You want to have the best safe vaccine ever because uh, it's prevention. It's already very complicated, but we know there is never a hundred percent safe vaccine. So there. You will not have an advance and you will see this is why you have this uh, safety monitoring board at each stage before and after we're regulatory. But it's something that the, definitely you always have to look at it very carefully. 
On the effectiveness, you put normally a threshold of what you want. You know, you de- my vaccine wants to be effective at 80%. You put your coverage. If your coverage is as gain at 80%, then 80 mile 80, make uh, 64, uh, correct, <laughs> percentage. And so then you, that is your expectation. Again, a lot of the time you put down this criteria and every time then you will rediscuss. But at least it's important in the beginning to put it down because it means that you have thought about and then you go back when you start to have the data and say, okay, is it enough? Is not enough? Should we reevaluate? Should we stop? Because maybe it's not a viable vaccine or no. Still, even if we reach only 50% due to the fact that the disease is very severe or there is no other vaccine available, or then maybe you still go on. But as but the message is always to have your goal and gates in mind. Then there is a balance as well about the safety immunogenicity, but I, I, I come to that. So another important uh, uh, factor, okay, you have identified the antigen, you have your target product profile identified with adjuvant you want to use, which formulation, in which population, and so on. You have the technology. That is beauty this morning, uh, uh, Christina talked about it. It's amazing how many technology and new technology are coming. And I believe we need all of them because there will be not one technology for all vaccine. And here, again, you can then identify which one works better to produce your vaccine. In a biotech, normally you have your own technology, so you do the opposite. With the technology, you say, okay, which disease can I address? Theoretically, it should be the opposite. You have an unmet medical need, and then you apply the best technology. It's good you can go theoretically or from a governmental point of view, an NGO point of view, but from biotech, most of the case is is the opposite. In this case, in the, in the Limatech, like a vaccine, we had this technology that makes conjugate in E. coli. We call it in vivo glycosylation. So we change the, the, the DNA of the, the, of the, the E. coli cells in order to make the glycan, um, and then to combine to a protein. And then you just uh, harvest your cells and you take out the product. Very nice technology because we thought it's not so, um, difficult, uh, a chromosome compared to the chemical technology that works as well, very well. But there you have to produce the glycan on one side, the protein, uh, uh, carrier protein on the other side, and you have to link it together. So, and they have, you know, it's a a very intensive uh, uh, manufacturing production. When you find the technology, then for sure, you have to be sure that they can produce uh, the antigen in the configuration that you want. Because in order to have an immunogenic response, and we know that in our case, O antigen gave protective antibodies, you have to be sure that the technology doesn't change the conformation of your antigen. So this you have to check for sure against the safety. This there is all the parameters that you have to look. But definitely what is important as well in the technology is that it's scalable, that is reproducible. At the end, you want to transfer to many different CMO or one, but it's nice when you can transfer to many. And they will talk to uh, this afternoon about it as well. So it has to be a robust process. And these are all things that you, you, you think are granted, but are not. Many times, uh, one times we saw that the wars, uh, we called woods in the vials. <laughs> we call it like this because actually we found that the wars in the vial little uh, cellulose and we say where it comes from. And then we found out that it was coming from a filter that we were using. So there is so many things that all the time can really put a hold in your vaccine development. In this case, a whole hold because you can resolve it. But in the biotech field, uh, field and especially in pharma, is different. Time is money. And sometimes these little things makes delay that then you don't have any more the money to go on. So more you are ahead, you can think about and try to avoid it, better it is. 
So actually already discussed. So then you need to produce. And as I say, you need to be able to scale up. You need to be able to formulate. For sure, there is all this characterization control test. Every time you will see something that is uh, happening. Uh, but again, at the end is uh, really you need to try to mitigate the risk and have a, a safe and reproducible and productive vaccine. When finally you have it in your hands, then you go to the preclinical testing. You know, you have some in vitro, say, you have some animals, uh, and sometimes you have animal model. Personally, I have difficulties in animals model because uh, Despite the fact that we have put a lot of research in it, it's not always really predict what it is in human beings. So there again, the, uh, but it varies on disease to disease. So when you uh, start to make a, um, um, a vaccine against your pathogen, check again what has been done. In the case of the uh, Shigella, uh, there was a, a PIX model available, or there is still um can give you an idea, but maybe it's not your go-no-go decision because maybe it's not so relevant to what then occurs into the um, humans. But maybe it's still good because it's still good to give you an idea how does it work. Say. It's still good maybe to convince other people that your vaccine is available and get resources. So that are all the thinking that you need to have. What do I need? From a regulatory, it's more clear because there is regulation. They want to see, you know, that is immunogenic. You, they want to see in combination with your adjuvant if you have. Uh, they want to see the safety. It's clear. But then what else you want to do to convince yourself that you want to go to the next stage? That is where you have to, to, to decide in your team with the expert and try to identify what you want to do or not. So in the Shigel, in our case, we thought about, okay, we just, uh, we did the animal model, but we, what we want to know to go on is our all serotypes are immunogenic compared to the preimmunosera. And that would be enough. And even I tell you, we didn't care which one was more immunogenic than others, because we saw that actually if in animals, uh, the serotype 2A was the most immunogenic, in human, actually, was not the case. It was another one, was the sunny. So that, again, you have to be careful. So they can, for sure, if it's not immunogenic in animal, I would say the chance that in human is immunogenic is very, very low. But to identify which one, do I need to increase the dose of one or not? From my experience, it's tough at least on the Shigella. And so the decision was, okay, we go and we do really the dose finding in human. We are not basing our dose finding in what we observe into animals. Toxicology, that is a must. I think uh, the safety, as we said, so the toxicology, you have to do it. You, at the end, is all together. Then you can eat. Think about if you want to have as well the monovalency to see a difference between the uh, vaccine altogether and monovalency. Um, sometimes the regulator may ask if the adjuvant is new. We, I, I heard this morning. Otherwise, in our case, they didn't ask because we use aluminum hydroxide, very known. So they didn't ask to have it separate. Uh, anyway, we had our vaccine with and without. But again, all these are consideration that you, you, um, uh, you you have to have in mind. We talk about competition and differentiation. In this case, in, in Shigella, there were others, uh, mainly institutional, working on it. Uh, there was just uh, the one part of GSK with another technology that were having as well a Shigella vaccine. But as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, uh, competition is not only bad, it is well good. Uh, try to look what do they do, try to learn from them, take the, the, their, uh, um, even try to be friendly in sense to, to uh, share the, the know-how. And at the end, you want to have a vaccine the, as fast as possible into the market. I understand from a company perspective, there is some confidential the reality that you cannot share, but uh, um, from a scientist's point of view, I think we need to public, we need to share information, we need to be the most open as is allowed to be. 
IP, I think we discuss. So now we reach the point of the animals. So we consider that the tox was good. Uh, uh, one point that happened to us against another gate, toxicology. It was not with Shigella, it was with another vaccine, but still I think it's, it's useful to share. Think as well there, which animals has been used the most in the, in the specific vaccine that you want to test. Uh, in this case, it was, uh, was Staphylococcus aureus, actually, was Staph. In our case, actually, we uh, they saw some uh, uh, rats that they were uh, changing their behavior. They were more sleepy. They were a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, um, affected. And um, and it was in the vaccine group. Not many, two, but still, you know, regulatory ask. And then we had to go through all the literature data of this uh, rat species uh, to identify that actually was something that uh, in a certain percentage occurred. And we could then uh, submit this data to show that was not related to, to our uh, vaccine. Again, was unforeseen. We never expected it, but that was lucky that these uh, species that we use was very highly used and we could uh, retrieve this data. And that, uh, again, is something that could go wrong because then if they don't accept, you go, you don't go in, into human and either you have the chance to redo your toxicology. But again, not always you have the, re the chance to redo things uh, due to money, due to competition, due to the situation. So manufacturing ready to enter into uh, first in human. Uh, I think we talk about the feasibility, the process, uh, the GMP, very important. You will have a talk later on. Uh, we haven't discussed about the essay. You had a talk, uh, you know, depending of the mode of action that you are thinking could be antibodies. Then you can think, okay, ELISA, uh, you can think about uh, functionality. What is important as well, uh, and in this case is uh, if you want later on to do a correlate of protection, so because if there is uh, no possibility to do efficacy trial due to the fact that maybe the incidence is not so high and there is no a pandemic ongoing, then maybe you want to use some correlate. But if you want to use some correlate, you need to have a very robust immunological assay. So before you think about which one potentially could be and you start to work on it and with the uh, either external key people, again, it will save you a lot of time. In this case, we look at the antibodies, we look at the T cells, P cells, but at the end, it uh, uh, we focus on the antibody response with uh, some functionality. So you want to enter into clinical. Um, Again, ahead, uh, you have to think about the endpoints. Uh, one of it, uh, are we going to license based on the efficacy? If it is efficacy, which clinical endpoints you want to see is, uh, you know, uh, eradication. So uh, the, the infection itself, uh, but the infection, what are the clinical symptoms you want to see? You want to check out the carriage. You want to have a, a, an immunological endpoint uh, with it. So these endpoints uh, really try to think about before. We call it hard endpoint. Uh, try to have endpoints that are not subjective. In safety, sometimes it's difficult uh, because uh, every patient uh, have a different uh, perception on uh, on pain. Fever is not subjective, for example. But so really think about uh, on your clinical endpoint. The biomarkers we discuss, and then what can you have in clinical that early the risk of your product? Uh, and this is uh, as well, uh, do you have human challenge study that you can uh, use it? Can we use a comparator that maybe is already in the vaccine uh, in the market that you can use in your clinical trial? Because if you see that you are not comparable, doesn't make sense that you continue. These are all considerations that can be a go-no-go -no -go decision for your trial early on because you have to keep in mind that before to the license, it's uh, 500 uh, um, million and, uh, and more. Interaction with a regulatory agency, that is as well, uh, it's uh, another important. Early you talk about uh, with them, better it is. Uh, 
They are your friends. Uh, at the end, the purpose, the vision is the same. More you interact with them at the early stage, you can ask all these questions, try really to have uh, um, an advice from them to not lose time. At the end, it's always the same, to not get into a stop that then would cost you time and money, and then you cannot proceed. So, oh, wow, my time is running over. So I didn't, as always, I took too much. I can tell you after more. That is just to show you that on the Shigella, we start with a monovalent because we didn't have the money to do all four. We did a monovalent. Actually, we start with Shigella dysentery, and then we realized that there was no human challenge study, so think ahead. And then we said, okay, no. Then we did the deflex NRI where there was, there is a human challenge. We did the human challenge in phase two. We get positive data. 52% against the most severe, against the old shigellosis was less. Again, the discussion, we reached we reach barely the, the threshold that we had in mind, but then we discussed, should we go on or not? What are the other competitors doing? So again, there was a good way to discuss how to proceed. And moreover, we saw that against the severe disease that where you want to prevent, it was very effective vaccine. So then we found the money to continue. We did a multivalency and actually now we completed a big trial in, uh, in Africa where we went from adults into kids, actually into infants and nine months. And this was really a stepwise approach where we check different doses. We check with and without adjuvant. Every step there is the safety data monitoring board that they check and they allowed you to go to the next at each step could be a, a stop uh, that you cannot proceed. And then this uh, um, is uh, actually is being complete. And I'm happy to say that the data was very encouraging. So this I can skip. I think my last point is, uh, so from the Shigella, 2000 and uh, Flexen in 12, uh, three years to proof of concept, uh, six years uh, to be where we are. We finished the phase two. We still have to do the phase three. So 10 years of work and we are still not on, on the market and the data looks good. And I tell you, it's not only that, it's now it's the founding for the phase three. That is a, a small market. So the big, there is no big uh, um, needs from a, a pharma perspective. So we are trying with grants, NGO, but there as well, there is other people that are doing as well. So they, as well, the money is restricted. So again, that's it's my message at the end. That is a really long path. So in order to be successful as possible is try to think ahead, try to put your gates. So go, no, go. Reevaluate every time because you don't know everything ahead and actually you don't know what you don't know. And uh, people are key. Really try to identify who are the key, key stakeholders in this field around you. Because at the end, I always like to say that uh, the, we are the human component of the vaccine is the one that is key. And so uh, if we can do all together, definitely we have a higher chance of success. And here the COVID is a proof of it. Huge need, everybody working together. We can make, we made it in two years. We are at 10 years uh, and still we are not there. So uh, we can talk later on why, why there is a big, this big difference, but I know that <laughs> I need to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Veronica. So um, questions um, are the last thing before lunch, uh, which starts at 11.55, so we have some time. Do you want to call on people as you see them? Um, uh, okay, we do a, a game like this or should change? <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, has anybody please. not asked a question yet in the past three days? Okay, so these three back in that row, we'll okay. take them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks for your presentation. Why don't you use CRM as, uh, for example, PCB and Mangokok, we use CRM. But why don't you use CRM because it's more easier than bioconjugation? But as I said, uh, in our case, uh, is a biotech. Biotech has their own technology. So you use the, the technology. And in this case, actually, glyco, to produce this type of vaccine in uh, in, uh, in vivo is, is, is quite simple. Once you demo 
you modify the, the cell line, then it's a E. coli production. So it's quite uh, easy. And you mean that you you have the in, uh, exclusive technology for like, engineering of E. coli, and by exactly. this way, it is a competition core for you, for example, for producing such vaccine than using CRF. Exactly. So this one cannot be used by the others. Exactly. Ah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Hi, Divya from the Wellcome Trust. Um, so I'm really glad you mentioned that people are key. And one of the groups that you, I didn't see listed there, but I'm sure I just wanted to know your thoughts on kind of patient and community representatives. And I wondered um, what your thoughts are on that and at which stage in the process you think is, is good to bring them into that really nice pathway that you showed on your first slide. Oh, very great question. Thank you. And thanks actually to Wellcome Trust because it was the one that help us to bring this vaccine ahead. Um, actually, it's key. And this is when I, I talk about, uh, um, in this case, that is really developing countries, uh, it's key to really go then to the people and talk with the community. In this case, we were in Africa in two sites, uh, in Kenya, and we really saw that actually at the end, you have to have, first of all, the local people convinced so you need, they have to be convinced that this vaccine is needed and that this, um, and this is a good vaccine. And before you do and you involve them in what you do, better they will be your ambassador of what they need to do. Because that are the people then we saw that they were going to their uh, village and actually they were going to talk to the village each village has like a, a head and to talk to them because only if they convince them and they convince the father the uncle uh, and all then they will bring their kids because our infants nine um, uh, nine uh, months old kids uh, to be vaccinated um, so i think uh, it's never too early but you don't have to go with just an idea because then it's too difficult and then people forget. You know, we have a quite short memory, unfortunately. And so uh, I, I believe there is a good moment. Um, my suggestion would be that when you have a good clinical design, but even before going to regulatory, but you have a good clinical design and you have already your data in, a, in a adults, uh, go and start to talk to them. And we visit many sites, uh, we talk with many people, and actually it was very good because they did an excellent work even during the COVID because we were doing it when COVID hit and everything was blocked. And these people were then traveling and trying to go to the family to retrieve, even the, when they could not to go to, to far away a certain region. So it has been very tough, but they did an excellent job. So yes, talk to them and try to explain, they communicate, somebody say about communication, people understand. If you communicate, people understand and tell them that you need them and make part of your family tree. In the green shirts, in back. Uh, thank you. My name is Adrian from Jakarta Health Office. It's a very interesting presentation. Uh, uh, especially the first slide about the, the step of making ideas and then uh, finally gain some money and, and all. Uh, but me as a medical doctor who works in the government officer as a program manager, uh, I still don't see where is our role in the uh, vaccine uh, development. I mean, we 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 have experience with uh, with many cases. We we see many people. We have all of the data, but I don't know how that we can uh, initiate ideas or to co to communicate our ideas and uh, to collaborate with other stakeholders in developing a uh, vaccine. So. Uh, do you have any experience in developing a uh, vaccine that were initially in, uh, initiated by by uh, people who work like in the government, not as people who work like as immunologists or someone who work in the lab? And what is your advice to those of us who work in the government? So yeah, we can we can uh, make a better a better vaccine in the future. Thank you. Yeah. Um, excellent question. So, first of all, uh, no, I don't have an experience myself. Uh, probably here uh, in, uh, in the room, there is others that have better experience. What I can tell you, um, without a sound, um, 
uh, cynic, how do you say, yeah, uh, arrogant. At the end, uh, you need money. It's a very expensive process. And uh, now that actually I'm in the VC, so I'm trying to give money to companies, small companies to develop things. Uh, I realized that uh, at the end, it's really everybody has, has a role. And you as a role of medical doctor or government actually have a big role. Because at the end, it's the government that should impose somehow, or impose maybe the too strong words, but should really make a, a political pressure that there is money available in the healthcare system, especially in vaccine, where it's more difficult because it's prevention. You know, when you have to cure, everybody wants to be cured, and then pharma is no issue because they see the, the, uh, the, the profit. In vaccine, you never know. And so I think it's a circle. We need to all of us play a role and uh, the people of the community and government uh, needs as well to play the role. How to make it? Again, communication, the right communication with the right channel. Try really to politically make, make a pressure because only if politically you make a pressure, then the institution then have an obligation. And then if the institution have an obligation, then there is more money available for then people to work on it. It's all a, a, a cycle into the research from a university, but as well in our case from a, from a venture capital so that we are asking to the institution to give us the money that we then try to make the right choice where to distribute. Then for sure you have NGO like Gates that himself is really a big believer and give a huge support uh, in in this. But uh, we need more than that. We definitely need more than that. But I don't know. It's it's a complex question that you're asking, and it's a, but it's an important one. I let you choose. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know. In the in the elevated seats there with the golden blouse on. Thank you. I wanted to find out in the process of clinical development, at what point is the correlate of protection uh, determined? And number two, when you have like these different uh, companies with different uh, uh, components of the vaccine, do you use the same correlate of protection or each company has a different correlate of protection? Thank you. Very good. Actually, I because I saw that my timer was passed and then I didn't spend time. Um very good question. So correlate of protection, and there is a lot ongoing, and I don't know, you have a session on correlate of protection. It was um, a, a couple of days ago. A couple, uh, yeah, because it's a, it's an important topic. Because now the big part, as I say, the pandemics, the big infection disease has gone. So we have to think other way to be able to bring uh, um, vaccine and uh, and not having these uh, 50,000 uh, um, clinical trial that uh, not only the cost, but as well the risk that something goes wrong. So in our case, um, first of all, yes, we were not the only one. There was a consortium talking about a correlate of protection uh, with uh, uh, Gates, uh, Welcome Trust, uh, other players that we really sit uh, and try to have uh, a standard CERA that could be used for, to evaluate all the different type of vaccine. It's not an easy thing to do because there is as well a lot of uh, interest behind. Um, for us, particularly how we did it, our correlate, um, we tried to evaluate. So first of all, we thought it should be antibodies. And then in antibodies, we check which one, IgA, IgA uh, I, um, IgG. We even look at the subclass. And then we try to look at as well about the functionality. We did it, it was very nice. Uh, this is why we did the human challenge study. Because with the human challenge study, we had people that were vaccinated and were protected against the, the clinical symptoms uh, because these people take the drink, the shigellosis, anatomy strain. This is why flexionary. And then uh, you expect uh, the placebo group has a lot of symptoms, diarrhea, cramps, fever, and so on. And uh, you have then the vaccine group. And in the vaccine group, uh, you have people that are protected, people know. In this category, you can really look at, okay, what was the level of antibodies of IgG, uh, IgA for the people protected and the one unprotected, and as well for all the different essay. And in this way, you try to establish your correlate of protection. In Shigella, you have a human challenge study. In other cases, you don't have, uh, I'm working now on a strep B, uh, vaccine, 
where we are discussing correlate of protection, which one is the right one. There is no human challenge, so it's more complex. We are discussing with regulatory agency. Moreover, people are more used on the correlate of protection with the capsule. This is a protein-based vaccine, so we have to demonstrate that as well the antibodies generated against the protein are protective. Um, again, you should have in mind as soon as possible and then try to evaluate in clinical. At the end, it's the human uh, sera that will uh, support you to uh, to see what is the right correlate. So one more question I think we can take before, otherwise we're cutting into your personal reflection time and I don't want to do that. So in the back, um, yes, go ahead. Turn on your microphone. Yeah. Hi, my name is Meiru. Um, thank you for a great talk. I guess it relates to a couple of questions that have come up before and the point you were talking about that not all diseases will get the same level of investment. And often that, you know, there's a balance of advocacy and demonstrating burden of disease. And we know that the burden of disease data may not be available in many settings where the burden might be high, and I have a background in working on group A streptococcus, and Shigella is another one. So, I guess at what what point do you emphasize as and thinking about public private partnerships about burden of disease data and the accuracy of that data to kind of promote and advocacy around that to get investment into a vaccine? Mm -hmm. We go back to the as well the question before. Uh, from the medical doctor and the government that, that that's come to reliable data, how they can support us. They support us in, in generating reliable data, in generating uh, um, epidemiology, in generating, you know, awareness of uh, what is going on. Um, because that then support the... is. Uh, the interest into then into the, the biotech and or people that put the money, and so it's um, yeah I think uh, again uh, it's uh, it's a combination of on different factor uh, with uh, all the people and try uh, I I don't have the right if somebody else I don't have a single answer to it I think it's really we need to publish. We need to to, uh, to gather data. We need to the, the community ourselves. Uh, we need to be strong and really in, in uh, make our voice louder, if I want to say. And in Shigella, what it helps us actually, and it's sadly to say, is because there have been cases in US, US, uh, Washington Post Journal. They put it. I put this uh, this uh, article into the presentation to investor, and then ah, oh, oh, really? And on one hand, it's sad, but that is what helps. He's, uh, and uh, and um, so this is an example. Eh? But uh, yeah, as I said, I, I think we should really try to, from the community and the government and medical doctor to say, hey, there is an issue here, there is a need, we need to work on it. And then you can use all the channels that you believe that are the Able. Uh, I'm not in Twitter, but uh, maybe. <laughs> okay. So any further questions? I think you can talk to Veronica at lunch. I'm sure her Definitely. table will be the most popular. <laughs> because I'm the last one. <laughs> Thank you.